Welcome into Press Box Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles of Press Box and PressBoxOnline.com. With me, as usual, on these Thursday night forays into the world of sports is Gary Stein. And that handsome gentleman before who feels like he just hit the Maryland lottery is Pete Karinji Jr., the coach of UMBC men's soccer. We're going to talk to him in just a moment after I tell you a little bit about the Costas Inn. The Costas Inn. Located at 4100 North Point Boulevard, everybody in town knows the Costas Inn is the preeminent place to go for steam crabs, crab cakes, crab soup. But they also have great specials Monday through Thursday, uh, a, a menu that doesn't stop. It's just incredible. But they know that a lot of people during the pandemic have gotten uneasy eating inside the restaurant. So they stepped up their curbside game. And uh, the way you do it is simple. Just go to costasin.com. That's their website. Look at their menu. You can order online. You can pay online. And you don't even have to get out of your car when you get there. 4100 North Point Boulevard, 477-1975. One of my favorite places of all time. They've been with me since 1995. That's close to 30 darn years, Gary Stein. <laughs> Known them longer and, and, than and you. you have an age today, Stanley. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> hey, speaking of uh, not aging, the last time I saw this guy was at MT Bank Stadium. And when was it, Pete? It must have been late July, I'm guessing, mid July. Yeah, it was July when they announced uh, the World Cup. Yep. And Baltimore got a little bit of the shaft there. You were pretty, you were pretty, I, I, I think everybody in that room was pretty optimistic that we were going to get it. Uh, talk about your emotions with that, because I know how much it would mean for this to come to your hometown. Well, that was uh, very emotional. I, I think, and you were there, um, the excitement started to really build, and there was kind of a buzz about Baltimore, Washington combining, getting yeah. it, and uh, the momentum was kind of picking up. And even the talk that day from people around the country was that we had a, a good shot of getting it. And, and that always wasn't the talk. You know, early on, we seemed to have – uh, they loved the stadium. They loved the presentation. Uh, we still were up against it, but clearly momentum was building. So you were there. The excitement kept coming and coming. It reminded me of a like of a New Year's Eve bash where you're waiting for the countdown, and once it, the clock hits and every, something happened, and like all of a sudden they told us we weren't in, and it, just the emotion in that room just was unbelievable. And uh, it's something I'll probably never forget. That's for sure. It's. It's not, it's not a death knell for soccer. And by the way, we're talking to Pete Karinji Jr., the head coach of uh, UMBC men's soccer team, off to a 5-2 and two start. We're going to talk to him about his team in just a minute. The fact that we didn't get it is not a death knell for soccer here. Baltimore has a strong soccer community. But it, it's, it's, gonna, it's like a punch in the gut. Where do you think we go from here is there any way, I mean, obviously, it'll, it'll be another 25, 30 years before the World Cup's coming back around here, but is there anything we can do to elevate the presence, or was this just a wired deal for Robert Kraft and uh, the folks in New England to get that? Well, I think we obviously have to, like, we're a, a great soccer city, have long tradition. Um, we just need that one figure um, that helps us get a pro team. And whether it's uh, obviously the MLS, it'll be tough because of going against D.C. Yeah. And they always kind of tie up Washington and Baltimore together. And like most markets, the soccer market is not the same. Um, Baltimore has its own soccer market. But but clearly, once we get that one person that'll be our figurehead with soccer, then we can start marketing and start going out and going behind doors and 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 negotiating and trying to get soccer here. I always thought you just hit the nail, nail on the head when Robert Kraft was behind it and he brings them in there, you know, the helicopter and flies them all around. And uh, it's a different story. Those kind of guys get things done. And not that we don't have that person here, but from a soccer standpoint, we don't. And I think if D.C. had it, they didn't really, uh, in my opinion, present it. So it, it was just a, a really strong soccer market that we have here and tradition and history going against people that have uh, also have money in their pockets and have pro teams. So, uh, you know, they have, they have a, a pro team in, in Boston and that's probably the, the main reason they got it. 
for me. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, Pete, let, let's just stay with that for a minute. You say that we have the tradition and the history. We obviously do, and you're a big part of that, et cetera. Um, but we don't have that guy. So is that guy a business guy? Is that guy a soccer guy? Is it two guys, a business guy plus a soccer guy? How, how do we get that guy? I think it's two guys. I think it's got to be a business guy. It's got to be a, a, a business leader, someone who can get out there and his name, recognized name, um, and, and then a soccer guy, someone who knows the people in the soccer community, someone who can, you know, talk to call a guy somewhere in another city who has connections and basically get on the phone and say, we really want this. And this is the reason why I, I, one of the things that I'm always amazed at was the Baltimore, um, convention center has hosted the national convention soccer, like almost every, every four years we get it. And that's an amazing, uh, stat because, people from all over the world in soccer. I mean, the, the best players, coaches, everyone from all over the world come to Baltimore and they loved it. They love the convention center. They love the convention. Obviously they love it because they come back every four years. And we're talking about every city in the country would love to have that convention. So we've had it. And that, that's something we almost took for granted. Um, but we did have connections. We have connections. You know, I, I personally was on the board of that United Soccer Coaches. Obviously I know people, a lot of people involved not saying that I got the convention to come here, but it didn't hurt that you know the right people. And when they come here, they always felt welcome. And they loved everything about it. So I think we had to build on stuff like that, our connections across the country. But you need to have that guy that's the business leader that says, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to get behind it. Um, I just felt like we were really we were really fighting hard. And we really, you know, the people want the people wanted it but it's always going to be the big guys with the money in their pocket that are going to pull things off like that. And uh, let's, uh, let's face it, FIFA, you know, it is about money. So it's not about how nice the Harbor is or the stadium at the end of the day, it is about money. And um, it's just so unfortunate that it happened that way because uh, it's such, it's a, it's a phenomenal event. And if Baltimore would have had it, it's something we all would have been like, I, like I tell my kids about it when I was involved with the, when it was down in Washington, DC, it's just, uh, it's truly a world event and something we'll, we'll never get a chance to see now, probably. So, Pete, let me ask you this, though. You talk about an MLS team. You think that Baltimore is pretty much locked out of an MLS team because of the proximity to D.C. and Philly. If the Orioles exist, the Ravens exist. So my question is, A, do a lot of Baltimore people go to D.C. and Philly to watch MLS soccer? And if the answer to that is no... How do we convince the MLS people that that is the case and that Baltimore is a viable market unto itself? Well, I think the answer was when we used, I think a lot of Baltimore people would go over and watch Washington teams play when there was a Baltimore area player playing. Um, okay. If you go back to the NASL, which I was fortunate to play in Washington for one year and obviously not, not make an impact, but, but clearly Sonny Askew was, and uh, a lot of players, a lot of people from Baltimore would go over and support our guy and, and support our team because Washington diplomats at that point were our team. And we had we had quite a few players from the Baltimore area played there. Roy Wilner being one guy graduated from Patterson High School. So we had a lot of guys in the old NASL from Baltimore playing. And then when the MLS comes, we have a 15 year old kid that signs from Hollandtown, Santino Caranta, and mm -hmm. he's the poster boy all across the country. And we have a great amount of pride for our guy. Our guy's playing now, our Baltimore kid. And, uh, and, he, and he showed well, and he, he was on the national team. So I, I would watch every D.C. United game and just to watch Santino play. And I think a lot of people from Baltimore, when you look at the, uh, when you look at the Premier League, one of the best ratings coming out almost weekly, I know for the it's last couple of years, has yeah. been Baltimore. And that's probably yeah. one of the best kept secrets that we don't even have a professional team in this town and yet people love to watch soccer and they watch the Premier League. So the interest is there. If, I, if we like our hometown guys, we'll support them. We'll go watch them. Um, that's why even like the local colleges, when you have the local players, you know, it, it, we have 2,000 people at a soccer game at UMBC. Gary, you know, years ago that was unheard of. But, unheard but that's, of, right? that's, not, that's not surprising anymore. So, yeah. um, but I think that all ties in. Baltimore – is probably not going to support D.C. or Philadelphia right now because myself, and I'm a soccer guy, 
Um, I don't have any real attachment to DC right now, and I don't have any real attachment to Philadelphia. I like their teams. I support soccer, but if there was a local kid on the team, um, I probably would, you know, t put a liking to them. So, and I think that's always been the tradition uh, of Baltimore soccer. We'll support ours. Um, and we were like at the forefront. If you go back to years when the, when the old NASL and all the, the Baltimore Comets, the Baltimore Stars, the teams playing at Memorial Stadium, Baltimore was always one of the first cities that involved in every league that came. Yep. And now we're kind of on the outs. And once again, I think it ties down to money, facilities. Uh, but clearly the interest is here. The people are here, in my opinion. But it's, it's just got to be. And I know in the last couple of years, there's always been someone – or, or, or a group of people talk about trying to bring a professional team here. But, you know, we're also not a real minor league city, as you guys know. So if you want to bring a, a minor league club here, um, it, it's got to be involved with local people for sure, or, or else it's not going to work. He, mm -hmm. let, let me stick with this a minute. And we'll get into talking about your team, which is five sure. and two after a tough loss up in Philly the other night. You sure. said Joe's, but um you know, we're pretty tight with Terry Hazeltine, you know, who, who headed yes. the effort for the, for the state. Uh, he's the executive director of Maryland sports. And he talked a little bit about us perhaps hosting a, a, a training facility for a world cup team and all that. Do you think that that's just going to fall by the wayside now, or would that still be in the queue to happen? And if it were to happen, would that would that be something that might light a light some kind of candle or something? Well, I think we still have a chance. Once again, it's it's us staying on top of things. They they love their facilities. They love the area. Um, so and they love the stadium. M and T Stadium was something that they really really loved. Um, and because I was there actually when we made the presentation. So so there's a lot of pluses about it, but. I think we, and Terry does a great job with this. Yeah. Terry's it, it, but we have to stay on top of it, trying to get any event we can um, to keep us in the picture because it, it's always going to be other cities that say, Hey, come to our city. We can present this. Um, but even if we had, if we host it now, if they're going to host a team, which they probably could, and then get them to play up in Philadelphia, um, it, it, it's going to have to be about hosting a, a team. Say if UMBC hosted it, that we're going to have to be able to allow um, the fans to come watch. We're going to have to have, uh, if practice they practice at M&T yeah. Stadium, to build that excitement, maybe have a, a festival with it. Um, and then you'll have people from all over the world coming to visit Baltimore. You'll, we'll feel more part of it than just being on the outside. But I, I think that's possible. But I think, once again, you got to stay on top of it and you have to give them a reason to want to come. And uh, that's going to be the key in the, in the next year or so. And one last question regarding this. Sure. Does it is it necessary for us to get that that hosting position for us to continue to have friendlies here? No, I don't think the hosting committee. I think we have we have a great tie. Uh, one, they love the facility. Two, we have a guy here who's who's now it's a local guy who ironically we you had met, him on. We had yeah, him on you, a couple. You met weeks. Mike Liber, and he's a former yep. player of mine and a good friend. And Mike's really involved nationally um, with his business. Um, and actually, he's, he's basically been over in Italy negotiating, um, bringing the top club teams in the world to, to the United States. So we have, a, we, have, we, we have a great friend and somebody like Mike, who's obviously a Baltimore boy. And uh, I think anytime he can bring something to his hometown, he's going to do it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think we're always going to be a player in that. And that also ties into the convention and, for, for a, a city that doesn't have uh, a, a professional soccer team now, it's amazing how we still are involved at the yeah. capacity we are because there's MLS teams that have that have this that don't get the convention and don't host world-class games like mm. that. Mm. Yeah. Pete, let's start talking about your team. Uh, Stan mentioned the tough loss the other night to St. Joe up in Philly 2-1. to one. I heard it was a coach. I heard it was a coaching loss. Yeah, yeah. Every the coach loses every game. It's the players that win. You know that. That was a tough one. I think they scored what the winning goal in the like 86 minute or something. My yeah. God. Yeah. But that can't put a damper though, Pete, on what is truly a great start for you guys. You guys are five, two, and one. You've got a, a ton of offense. 
Um, your goalkeeper obviously is playing well, uh, Quadrell Jones, nine goals allowed in eight games. Talk a little bit about your offense. I mean, I, I don't call the games Mittermeier does. He and I are tight. We talk about your team all the time. I've watched quite a few of them. You guys can score. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, Betcher and Calhera and these guys that can put the ball into the net. Well, they're, you know, I always said to be a really good team, you have to have more than one goal scorer. Um, it, it, you get two or three that you're going to have a chance to, to win a championship. And I think that this team has uh, more than one goal scorer. Kyle Herr obviously is, is our go-to guy. He unfortunately couldn't play because he had four yellow cards. Four yellows, and, yeah. And he had to get the fifth one to not sit out this game rather than our game coming up is more important. So not right. having him in the lineup hurt. And then Jay Golot, our center midfielder, who's our key player, our leader in the middle field, he didn't play. So going up there in, uh, in Philadelphia, and not to have an excuse, but it, it's, you take two key players out of a lineup that's playing really well. Um, and I think part of our, our problem right now is we like to go forward so much. Everyone likes to go to goal. There's got to be times where you got to put a stop to it and understand that, um, you know, other teams are trying to go forward. So you got to defend a little bit. So I think that's something that we're talking about working. But, yeah, from an offensive standpoint, Taylor Calahara, I think, is one of the best forwards in the country. He's a kid I clearly think will be playing professionally one day. Ryan Betcher, Fowler was a pro player, a big indoor player, um, continues. He was always a defensive midfielder. We moved him up. He's scoring goals um, like he has his whole life and, and a great player. Another player, I think, who's going to have an opportunity to play. You got Spencer Hanks is a local kid from Arundel, Anne Arundel County. Always scored goals, was injured last year. Came back, he was one of the, like two weeks ago, he was the leading scorer in the country. So we have that kind of firepower. And we also have some guys that are younger that are coming off the bench that are getting good experience playing games um, that can help us down, down the, you know, in the key games coming up during the conference. Uh, Stan, let me ask just one more real quick. Go ahead. I wanted to ask about Calhera and Betcher in particular, the sons of two very accomplished indoor players Adato yes. Neto for the Blast, and of course, Bill Betcher for Harrisburg. Because they're the sons of professional players, do you see their relationship to the game a little differently than other players who may not have that pedigree? Great question. Yeah, you definitely see it. You just see the instincts, um, having been around the pro game. Your father's a pro. Your father's been in that uh, professional locker room. Your father's been involved in coaching um, they just, it, it, they just have it and you see it every day in, in the training. Um, it's, it's not like it's, it's almost ingrained in them that they're out there training It's very few times. I can say either one of them ever come to a game or a practice where they didn't give it their best and it always carries over in the game. So, yeah, I think that's a big, big plus when you have that. Cause I think both of the dads have been very supportive. I think more pro players, if you play professionally, you're going to be more understanding rather than this, harping on them and hey come on you got to do this you got to do that um which kind of turns kids off you can see both of them are um well in tune to the game and uh love they love the game which is a great credit to their dads for having them around but not pressuring them and what they mm -hmm. have to do right pete um when i when i did my heavy research for this interview tonight i said <laughs> let me look at who pete's got on his team i know he's gonna have a lot of local kids and all of a sudden, I'm seeing, you know, Bowie, and I'm seeing, you know, all the cities around here, York, PA. And then all of a sudden, I see a kid from Denmark, a kid from Germany, a kid who at least was born in Poland, a Germany, another Germany, UK, Norway. Uh, they must give you some kind of huge budget over there to recruit. <laughs> Man, I wish they would give me that huge budget. Yeah, honestly, can, can we repeat that? Can yeah, we say that real loud and slow? <laughs> um, I, I, the one, the, the good thing is the kid from Poland. He's yeah. uh, he's been living in Maryland for a couple of years. I like, figured that. Yeah. He grew up so, uh, but he put down Poland, and that's where he was born. So, so I, I don't quite. So your reputation, though, all kidding aside, your reputation is is, is plays a part in this. How do you reach out to them? Do they reach out to you? How does well, the recruiting dance it, It's a work? little bit of both. Um, I think more and more foreign kids see um, America as a, a second opportunity. Good players, because a lot of them get released early at a young age. So they can still come here, get their education, and then get a chance to play at the next level. 
Um, so, and for us personally, we've had a great run. A lot of them contact us. I mean, we get, we get letters literally stand from all over the world, um, you know, daily. And, and we can't even go, you can't get back to everybody because it's impossible, but the, the reputation of the school, the name of the school. And I think that's in general now, the, the, the feeling of coming to America, playing college soccer, it's a great situation. It's almost like uh, a semi-pro kind of, mm -hmm. like our field and our facility is as good as a lot of, or better than some of the minor league pro teams. So you come to college and um, so, yeah, we do contact them or we'll have contacts over there. After all the years, they kind of call us and say, hey, this kid's really special. He's a good student. He's got to be a good student. They've got to come over and want to play. Um, I mean, that's the first thing we talk to them about is as much as you want to play, you have to get your degree. This ain't, this ain't come yeah. and just play soccer, uh, um, right. which probably happened 30, 40 years ago. You know, when, when the kids, foreign kids would come to America or even when the Americans come, I, kn I know I personally played one of the best teams that ever came out of here. And some of the guys, I, I don't think uh, the degree was ever mentioned to them. And unfortunately, yeah. it's, it's sad because they were great players and never got their degree. So that's so something way, that we stress. So the way it is today, it sounds like it's a real win-win for the institution and for the player. He gets, yes, the, he yes. gets it's almost like a minor league feeder to go exactly. back and play in Europe. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I think more and more European clubs are now seeing the American college game a little bit differently because of the facilities. Uh -huh. um, and those guys are, those guys are amazed because a lot of those kids, when they come over and we're not just taking every foreign kid that contacts us, if actually it, it would probably turn away a lot more. Um, but yeah, do contacts and more and more teams. Like one of the reasons we've started taking more foreign players, we were an all Baltimore team for, for years was because we were going out and playing, we were playing teams in our own conference that had 23, 24 year old men and playing against our, our 18, 19 year old kid from the local high school. And we'll compete. We I'm not knocking that. I'm not criticizing yeah. that, but there's a big age group. And I think more and more are coming over from all over the world to, to want to play every sport. It's just not soccer. It's basketball and every sport involved now. Pete, uh, you know, there's no question you go back 25, 30 years ago, the American soccer player was not really a respected entity. Has that player today, is he a much more well-rounded player and really understands the game? I think overall, yeah. I mean, because there's so many more of them. Like when we grew up in East Baltimore, we had some of the best players in the country that came out of there. And we loved it and lived it, but there wasn't something that was as widespread. Now soccer's everywhere, and these kids are all coming up, and they're they're all there's so many more involved and much playing at a different, higher level than just locally. So now you got kids here in Baltimore competing all over the country, um, and their leagues, not like we did. We our leagues were in Patterson Park, and then you kept advancing and advancing. Um, but but clearly, I think kids are getting more opportunities playing at a younger age. Soccer's ingrained into the country now. Yeah. Soccer is part of the fabric of our sports world. And, you know, I, I laugh because there's people still around the country go, well, when I was brought, when I was, you know, being, we didn't have soccer in our community. And I laugh because in, here in Baltimore, there's not many communities that didn't have soccer. So I think we were ahead of the curve here. Um, but we still, we, the, the amount of great players that we have in here in this town and this state is as good as any in the country for sure. Sure. You got one or two more for coach and then we'll yeah. get out of here. Pete, I, I know that the American player is better than they used to be. Right. Um, but compare it to the international player. Like it's never been before until the last few years when we've been able to see firsthand the EPL, the Italian series, the Bundesliga, you know, because it's on cable. Now we can watch that every weekend now. It, are, are we closing the gap with the international talent in, in your opinion? I think we're closing the gap. Uh, not as quick as I would like. I still think there's a lot more better players because it's, it's everywhere now, but I still think that the parental pressure on a lot of these kids in general, the, the, the whether it's soccer or any sport um, where I think a lot of the great players that I was around, we all went to the park and we played every day. It was street, it was street soccer, it was street baseball, it was street, you know, it was school lot. You, you went there every day and, and you watch players get better. 
and you watch players play at a high level. And I think now there's so much pressure on taking Johnny and Mary to their games and, you know, and, and wanting them to be a great player, getting that scholarship that a lot of the, the, a lot of kids will leave the game a lot earlier than than should be. Um, is the American player better? Yes. Are they closing the gap? I think yes. I think the key for me is that in, in our own league, the MLS, we need to put more American. We need them young Santinos back and we're, we're going to continue to get better. Yeah. When, when Santino and all those guys played on the national team and they were 16 years old, well, when they got to be 18, 19, they weren't afraid of anybody. Um, and they, they, they grew up together. And it's like anything. It's like the Orioles. You get a farm system that's successful and they all come up. They're going to be successful, right, as, as pros. And that's what happened with soccer. And now I think we're reverting back to just bringing guys in from all over the world. We're helping those countries, but it ain't, for me, it's not helping uh, U.S. soccer get to where we want to be or we thought we should be by now. I mean, I remember, Gary, when everyone said, oh, in 20 years, you watch U.S. soccer, we're going to be, we're going to win the World Cup. And I bought it, you know, but mm -hmm. I, but we're not close to winning the World Cup right now. Um, mm -hmm. But we are getting better and better. And take the politics out of anything. Um, let's find the right players. There's so many great players in this country, but are we putting the best players on our lineup or are we getting them the opportunities? I guess that's that's what you have to question. Mm -hmm. Coach, let me ask you one more question. It's it's uh, almost hard to believe that what are we going on nine years now since that 2014 season when you guys, I mean, literally, it was one of the greatest sports stories in the history of Baltimore sports. UMBC soccer, men's soccer wins the conference championship, goes to the NCAAs on the road, four straight games, shutouts all across the board to the NCAA semifinals. Talk about a Cinderella story. My question is, even though it's eight or nine years ago, when you go into a recruit's house and you, you say you're from UMBC, is that still a thing for you? Do you st are you able to trade off that success to get recruits to come here? I think, I think you, you, yeah, there's, especially um, because, as you said, it was one of the really biggest surprises in, in college soccer history. And so you're always going to be a part of that. And then you parlay the fact that the basketball team like a year or two later, right. I saw Virginia. So UMBC reputation went from, you know, not really good. Well, not, I, I shouldn't say not really good. It was good to really, really good. And I obviously now we walk in someone's house. Um, you don't have to explain anything other than they want to talk about the final four. Or they want to talk about what, what now their kid or why they should go to UMBC. So you're not selling the name of the school anymore. They know about it, but, but clearly it is, it is, it helped a lot and you know I think that's always going to be there now once you accomplish something like that and yeah I mean I, I when I, I think about it it's an, it was an amazing time with an amazing group of players and uh, the best part about it Gary was like 90% of them were all from around here and I know <laughs> so, so I get a chance to see them a lot and uh, it's almost every time you get a chance to see them it's like it brings you right back to that time and place because they're all local kids. And that's something that like our era, when we won at University of Baltimore, Loyola won the national championship, you're always going to be bonded by that particular date and, and that run. And uh, yeah, it's something that that's never going to go away. Do you get a lot of disappointment when you're out recruiting coach, when you tell them that Gary Stein isn't doing the play by play for soccer now? Is it that really a has. It really, it, Stan. It really is. Probably, I was going to talk about that on here. I, 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 I got. <laughs> There's another way. way to look at it. We could call it the Mittermeier effect. You know, oh, I mean, well, it's. Like, a you're talking about two of the best. I mean, you're you're talking about two <laughs> Hall of Famers, Stan, along with yourself. So, look in the Baltimore area. You're talking about the the Mount Rushmore. So <laughs> you got to get Gary. I I heard that that you know we need to get Gary. I said let's bring Gary back. We got to get him to do soccer again. Yeah. Put him and Paul together. Yeah. Whatever it's going to take. I'm going around to all my and uh, guys that I know in the area <laughs> in the town. You know a guy. I know a guy. And we're going to try to see if we can bring back uh, that combination of Gary and uh, Paul Minimeyer back together. All, all right. right. Hey. Sounds good. Hey, coach. Before we let you go, you got a couple games coming up at your at, at the home facility. Tell us about them. Yes, we have a real big game this Saturday against Albany. Um, seven o'clock, right? Seven o'clock. Yes. We'll have a big crowd. We expect a big crowd. It should be a great night for soccer. Um, clearly, Albany's always been one of the better teams in the league. And I think like any sport where you can throw out their record and once you play conference games, it's a whole different 
it, it's a whole different game because the, the intensity level, it's, you know, it's like football when they talk about interconference games. Well, um, that's what it'll be with soccer. And then we have UMass Lowell coming down. We've, we've always struggled playing up there. We always do much better up here. It's a conference that because of our facility, we're the only ones that have grass. We have a perfect field. Um, we're a much better team on grass at home. As you guys know, travel on this conference is crazy. So um, eventually what? we got it next week. We got to go up to UNH and they were the number one team in the conference the last couple of years. So that's going to be a battle. And it's what's the, uh, date, what's the date of that check in home game though. That's uh, the second home game next week. We play up in UNH mm -hmm. and then it's the, the following week, the following Saturday. All right. So this Saturday at seven o'clock and then yes. two weeks later, at two weeks seven later, o'clock. Yes. Seven, seven o'clock, yeah. All night all right. games, all night. All right, Coach. We really appreciate your spending some time with us, and especially thank you guys. The, the Always a pleasure. The, the knowledge you have of that technology to get on here was just <laughs> it was um, amazing I, I, to watch. Hey, I don't even know if you could see my neck. So this you can. This is going to be a classic because I literally had no idea how to get on this, and I called Steve Levy, and you know, but hey, I'm I feel I feel like I hit the lottery. Hey, Ga Gary and I are both Jewish. Uh, before tonight, I only thought it was Jews over 60 years old <laughs> no, no. that didn't have any idea of technology. <laughs> Pete, so maybe Pete I don't know. think, Pete, we're not sure that you actually have a neck at this point. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks again, hey, Pete. Really hey, you might have, this might be a classic one day. This might be <laughs> I'm sure classic. Friend, I think I'm going to have to tell everybody we can't get this on, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. All right, All right. Pete. Thanks, All Pete. Right, and we thank Pete uh, Karinji Jr. I didn't know he was a junior. Oh, this yeah. Gonna, he's a junior. This is going to be fun junior. watching. It's going to be fun watching. He got off pretty good. He was touring the room and everything. <laughs> Gee, Stein, before we uh, hit, the, hit the road, I know you were uh, at the ball game uh, Sunday against the Dolphins. Um, uh, an amazing comeback by the Dolphins. Sort of an amazing collapse by the Ravens, but uh, your thoughts on that game and whether it's really got any long lasting effect on the team. You know, it's funny. Uh, Tom Davis and I used to have a battle about this all the time. Yeah. Tom's position was a loss is a loss, right? Doesn't matter when it happened. Doesn't matter if you lose a game in the first week of the season, yep. or the 17th week season. It's just, a, it's just a loss. It's just a number. I said, Tom, that there's, that is so far from the truth that you are divorced from reality when it comes to professional sports. And so to, to answer your question, Stan, I'm actually glad that, that if, if something like that is going to happen, it that better happen early. in the first few games so that you can correct it on down the road. Do I think it's going to have a long lasting impact? It's really going to depend on if they obviously can make a comeback. Look, I'm not going to sit here and neither are you probably going to add anything new to the debate. That's going to shine a light on yeah. something that, you know, uh, uh, that you know, 80,000 people didn't see on Sunday. We obviously know what the problems are, okay? It's up to the coaching staff and the players from within to correct them. The only good news is that hopefully uh, better health is coming and that yep. there are 15 more games to play. All right, well said. I was frankly surprised based on that game that the odds makers still favor the Ravens going up to uh, New England. And I'm shocked, two, actually. Yeah. What, what's the spread? I, it's a two and a half point to two and three and a half. point spread. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, but I think the Ravens have, like you say, they've got, they've got time, but uh, they really haven't been a healthy team now for quite a while. And now, isn't this, isn't this like six out of seven games that John has lost? Uh, did well, they close he lost the season last, last year. Well, they were they were eight and three at one right. point last they year. They finished eight and nine. Right, so that's so six. They lost six. They've lost seven of eight games. Seven of eight. That's, that hasn't happened in John Harbaugh's, and, and it's not all. It's not clearly all his fault. A lot of injuries. Yeah, I mean, one thing I think we can look forward to. I think this is going to happen. I think Dobbins will play on Sunday, but what at at what level? Yep. We just don't know yet until he gets on the field. All right. Do you have a gut feeling whether we'll see Ronnie Stanley? In two, uh, we've weeks. talked about this before. I, yeah. if, I don't think we're going to see him in the, we'll call it the first quarter of the year. If he's healthy enough, maybe in the middle of the year. Yeah. But if I were the Ravens, I would be going into the season with the expectation that we're not going to get a lot out of Ronnie Stanley yeah. this year. Sure looks that way right now. All right. Yeah. 
that you saw the news today that they signed uh, Pierre Paul. I, I did. Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, I guess helps. I hope it helps. Yeah. Maybe I'll give him a little shot in the arm and a little energy at getting to the quarterback because that is one of the problems they've had. Uh, the oh, past there's no two doubt. Season. Yeah. All right, Gary, maybe we'll watch that game together. Uh, Sunday. Yeah. Sunday. We could do that. All right. All right. Love you, brother. Sounds good. I love, love you too, Mick man. And Pete and all the folks out of Costas in. Thanks for uh, sponsoring us again. And we will talk soon down the road. Uh, Monday night, uh, Ross Grimsley and I are going to have ex oriole pitcher Bill Swaggerty, who lives oh. down in the Sunshine State of Florida. We'll talk to Bill Swaggerty uh, Monday night. For Gary yeah, Stein and uh, Coach Pete Coringi Jr., I'm Stan the Fan Charles, and we'll see you down the road. I'll be on with Glenn Clark tomorrow morning, Friday morning, uh, all the way through the show, 10 to 12. Bye. See you later.